The Tom Woods Show, episode 731. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're like me, you get more email than you can cope with, and you frankly don't know what to do about it. Well, do what I do. Use SaneBox to declutter and get your life back. Check it out at SaneBox, S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash woods. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. We're doing an episode that I'm sure a lot of beginners will appreciate, but I'm telling you it's not just for beginners. It's going to be an interesting conversation with Todd Seavey, author of the new book, Libertarianism for Beginners. So let's jump right into it. Todd, welcome to the show. Thanks. All right, you have this new book, Libertarianism for Beginners. I would have been interested to talk about this book anyway, but I've actually had several people write to me just in the past week saying you really should do a Libertarianism 101 episode. And I have a lot of people coming, listening to the show who are really new to all this. And sometimes on the show, it may sound like I'm talking inside baseball. I'm throwing out names that I assume everybody knows. I'm throwing out concepts and acronyms and it can be a little bit much for people to grasp. So at the same time, people who are advanced at it can stand to have a refresher from time to time. And I thought your book gives me an opportunity to do that. And yet, at the same time, your book could give us an opportunity to talk about all the factions and the movement and all these super detailed things that, you know, geeks like us are interested in. And I'm sure. sorry, I don't mean to call you a geek. <laughs> but, oh, no, that's okay. I also answer to nerd. <laughs> okay, yeah, me too. Me too. That's all right. So if we were to talk about the basics of libertarianism, what I'd want to do is talk about the foundations of it, like where does, what are the basic ideas, where do they come from, um, how it can be applied – in easy to grasp cases, how it can be applied in trickier cases, and then maybe some problems, some difficulties, some challenges that it faces today. That's the structure I'd like to follow now. So let's say you're on C SPAN and you're pushing this book and you got to hook people in in that first minute or so or two minutes. How do you introduce libertarianism to them? Uh, I would say that although it can get complicated in some people's minds, the easiest formula is uh, it's the claim that you should have the legal right to do whatever you want with your own body and property as long as you don't use someone else's body or property without his permission. And you can add thousands of footnotes to that, and certainly people have. There, you know, there are uh, elliptical approaches involving uh, economics and foreign policy and constitutional law, and certainly the way the philosophy arose historically was gradual and piecemeal. But I think if you keep that basic formula in mind that you shouldn't use someone else's body or property without their permission, it at least makes it a lot easier to predict what the libertarian position will be on virtually anything. And then you can come in later with the special cases and the qualifiers and the gray areas. All right. That is a very good way for people to understand it. Now, then the question might be, well, why? Where does that principle come from? And of course, libertarians have given a lot of different answers to that question. Would you say it's just a basic moral intuition that people ought to have? But then on the other hand, not everybody has that intuition. So where, where do you derive it from? Or where do you find the most persuasive account to be? Well, uh, this is another thing libertarians are divided on. But in my case, I'm what's called, and now this might sound like we've actually left libertarianism for another even more complicated area. But basically, I'm a rule utilitarian. Uh, a utilitarian is someone who wants to maximize the happiness uh, of everyone, and uh, that is, uh, give them the most utility. Uh, and a rule utilitarian is someone who thinks that instead of just running around willy-nilly deciding from moment to moment and action to action what will make people happy, you should try to figure out the set of predictable, uh, long-lasting rules that will tend to maximize happiness. And I would argue those rules are uh, property rights. Uh, and that's not just uh, arbitrary or a historical observation. That's based largely on, I guess you could say, Austrian-type uh, economic reasoning. That is, if, uh, if you've got property rights, 
then instead of one person's desires trumping another's, uh, you'll have to trade and reach mutually beneficial exchanges and agreements. And the odds are if both parties in the exchange want to make the exchange, want to make some trade or want to interact with each other, they're probably happier doing so than if they had been forbidden to. Uh, so uh, utility and property rights, I think, go together pretty neatly, although there are certainly people who find that implausible. I think that sounds like a, uh, a happy coincidence um, and, uh, you know, the, the, it strains credulity. Um, but I, I think we know from everyday experience, if somebody grabs your arm and says, you can't, you can't go in there, uh, or takes your stuff, you're probably, at least in the short term, uh, less happy. So either you have to say everybody's granted some measure of independence and autonomy to make their own decisions with their own bodies or, uh, or property, uh, or you've got to come up with some plausible argument for why uh, somebody else, whether it's a commissar or a monarch or a senator, is better at figuring out what your real desires are and what your body and your property ought to be doing. And I've never heard a persuasive theory uh, for how people become masters of figuring out other people's happiness that well. So I'd say leave it to individuals. That's the basic reasoning. All right, now let's leave aside for the moment private police and things that are difficult for people to see. Sure. Give me the basic overview then of how these insights, this basically this moral insight, how this translates into everyday life. Uh, well, I'd say if you if you can't uh, use someone, if you can't morally uh, use someone else's property uh, and body, then presumably you can't punch people in the face, so that's going to you know, come cut down on bar brawls. You can't be a burglar in good conscience, uh, and you can't tax and regulate, uh, since that would also involve using other people's bodies and property without permission. So if you're really consistent about it, uh, you'd end up with no rapists, no governments, no violent street gangs, no serial killers, no jihadis, uh, and so on. Um, as a practical matter, some of those people will still exist. They won't follow your rules, and then you have to come up with security guards and other ways of fighting back against them. But at least if there's a prevailing assumption that those are all bad things to do, uh, I think you'd, you know, you'd have a much more peaceful and prosperous society left to trading and commercial activity and voluntary interaction. Now, if you were coming from a pure natural rights perspective, I could imagine you saying, I favor no state at all because the existence of any state involves the violation of rights. Now, your language is not altogether you know, a million miles remote from that, but I could see a utilitarian being a bit more cautious and saying, well, look, what I ultimately want is, is happiness for as many people as possible. And since I can point to only a few obscure examples of statelessness, that's a little bit more risk than I'm willing to take because if it turns out my social theory is wrong, then I am condemning to great, great misery as a, instead of happiness many, many millions of people. So does it not seem that it's a bit of a leap to say I'm, I'm confident that I – mean, in other words, where does this confidence come from that what you're describing in terms of a completely free society without taxation and regulation, without the state, won't actually wind up being a dystopia that no rule utilitarian? would ever want to support? Well, I'd say the confidence is not so much in uh, what the final product of anarcho-capitalism, as they call the uh, you know, extreme version of libertarianism where you eliminate the whole state. The confidence is not so much that we know exactly what anarcho-capitalism would look like, but more that we know from bitter, repeated experience how quickly government screws things up if it has any responsibilities at all. And uh, I wasn't always as anarchist in my thinking, I suppose, as I am now, <clears throat> uh, and tended, like a lot of intellectuals, to focus on right versus left arguments, where each side had kind of an idealistic blueprint for how things should run, and I would just, you know, debate which of those sounded more appealing. But if you look at a lot of the uh, non-ideological nitty-gritty of how government operates, you start to realize that even local dog catchers abuse their power and police can't be trusted regardless of whether they're doing right-wing things or left-wing things. Money gets misappropriated, whether it's a Democratic committee or a Republican committee. And at some point, I think you have to ask yourself, 
would there ever be a government so small that it wasn't behaving badly? Uh, and I, I rather doubt it. Uh, and even in a world where there is a government, people already turn to private security guards and arbitration firms and things like that. Uh, occasionally even build private roads, even right here in statist New York City where I am. Uh, there are some private roads in Queens. Uh, so it just seems like no matter uh, how small you try to make government, it's whatever's left of it is still screwing things up. Uh, so we can at least keep moving in the direction of less government. But I will say, uh, as anarcho-capitalists go, I suppose I have been sort of cautious and moderate in that, uh, and one of the reasons I've gotten along well uh, in the past with more mainstream political people is I always thought of anarcho-capitalism as sort of a direction instead of just a, an overnight uh, end point. Uh, why not just keep shrinking government and see how far you can take it rather than dismantling the whole thing overnight? On the other hand, the older I get, the more impatient I become. Uh, but basically, I, I, in the past, I always figured as long as people are trying to deregulate, cut taxes, cut spending, they're headed in the right direction, so things are getting better. Why not just keep pushing and see how far it can go? And if you reached the point where government, instead of being, say, 40% of national income, was down to 4%, you might find people were then more confident about their ability to experiment with going all the way, hiring, they'd have more money to hire uh, private security guards and arbitration firms and the like, and would be more psychologically accustomed to doing things uh, as free individuals instead of relying on the government. It's harder to imagine doing those things when government is everywhere. Just as it was difficult for people in the Soviet Union to even imagine art or food existing without the party because it claimed to be everything. Are there any arguments that libertarians make? Is there any position, any particular policy area where you feel like the libertarian position deep down, you might not want to admit this publicly until now, but really isn't as strong as you'd like it to be? Oh, well, uh, let's see. Um, I, I suppose uh, the, point, the point you've already brought up that we haven't seen a uh, fully functioning anarcho-capitalist uh, society that's gone all the way uh, is, is uh, certainly reason to be cautious and, uh, and, and pause and reflect, uh, although that's, my answer to that would basically be approach it gradually. Um, as for whether uh, a functioning anarcho-capitalist society would be doing anything I didn't like, uh, probably not. I will say in the current list of political issues people debate, there are certainly hasty arguments that get deployed often. Uh, so on, say, climate change, uh, maybe it's not uh, a huge problem, but it is worth at least thinking carefully about how anarcho-capitalists would deal with it uh, if it were and recognizing that there might have to be some rather elaborate class action suits against major CO2 emitters, for example, if that were deemed to be the big problem. And, uh, and some anarcho-capitalists should at least recognize that some of these coordination problems uh, are complicated when you get into large-scale problems like that. And similarly, having uh, national defense is a little more complicated than uh, anarcho-capitalists sometimes pretend, but I, I still think uh, I still think those problems could be dealt with. And uh, it, it's uh, it, a lot of the in-between cases. What do you do when things aren't quite privatized and they're not fully socialist? Uh, can get messy and lead to people making overly uh, hasty arguments. I mean, well, you you talk about the Federal Reserve all the time. That's a good ambiguous case. I mean, it's like Wall Street is, in theory, the most capitalist part of the planet, but it's also the locus of a lot of bad policy connected directly to government decision-making. Um, to what extent should libertarians think like Wall Street Journal readers and applaud the stock market going up, and to what extent should they think this whole system is rigged and bogus, it all ought to be burned to the ground? Um, that's sort of ambiguous. Um, I, I will also say that, uh, of course, I sometimes uh, get frustrated with the uh, specific tactics uh, my fellow libertarians use and a lot of the infighting. Uh, so, for instance, the, a lot of them have been uh, beating up on Gary Johnson lately, and, uh, and I don't blame them. He's not a perfect libertarian. Uh, but then again, I feel like if they took a look around at the rest of the world and saw how statist it is, 
they probably wouldn't be as upset with them uh, as they are. And uh, in fact, here in New York City, there's going to be a protest on Thursday uh, urging uh, Hillary Clinton to uh, let Jill Stein and Gary Johnson into the presidential debates. I don't think Hillary will be moved by this, but there will be protesters Thursday night outside her uh, headquarters um, chanting, open the debates, uh, saying we should get uh, Gary Johnson in there. And, uh, well, uh, since this is a Libertarianism 101 broadcast, it's worth keeping in mind that even the most basic, simple versions of the libertarian argument are still very novel and thus often very powerful uh, for most people in the population. So even if there's a libertarian you disagree with drastically, just having somebody out there saying free markets are good, government tends to be inept, we should try cutting spending. I mean, to some people, those are still blockbuster, shocking ideas. All right, I got some juicy questions coming up for you. First, let's say thanks to our sponsor. Let's see how much like me you are. Every day, email pours into your inbox, and you get to about 80 to 85% of it. But every day, that 15 to 20% is still there, eating away at you, calling your name at night. And you know you're never, ever going to be able to get back to all of it, and it's frustrating and soul-crushing. Well, I'll tell you something. I emancipated myself from that pit of despair with SaneBox.com. I use SaneBox and I can't live without it. It sorts out my important email from my less important email. It also gives me the option to get certain emails resent to me on days when I'm going to have time to deal with them. So I can clear all my emails out every single day and say, I have reasserted control, baby. Well, check it out at SaneBox.com. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X.com slash Woods. Get a 14-day free trial. And if you decide to stick with it, you get an automatic $25 Tom Woods Show discount. So head over to SaneBox.com slash Woods. All right. I want to ask you about a, an issue that's current in libertarianism that I don't think is in the book, but that makes it all the more fun, right? You have no idea what I'm going to ask you. There's been some talk among some libertarians, and I even did an episode where I talked to one of the proponents of the uh, the basic income guarantee. Ah. Now, you're no doubt familiar with the arguments pro and con. Yep. And when you mentioned Gary Johnson, I know he had something to say about it, so that reminded me of it. I'm curious to get your thoughts about whether there's a libertarian case for a basic income guarantee. Well, uh, I, I suppose it depends – how narrowly you define uh, libertarian. I think I, there are definitely people who are uh, largely libertarian uh, who are pushing the idea, including some of the so-called libertarians. And, uh, and in a way, Charles Murray has made uh, similar sorts of arguments that if you guaranteed everybody a basic income, you could uh, get rid of all these other elements of the welfare state that are more wasteful and bureaucratic. Uh, my hesitation in defending it, uh, besides the fact that it would require the government to exist, which is obviously a big no-no, uh, but, but even if I were a minarchist, I'd be hesitant to defend it only because any time a government policy is sold as something that will replace a whole bunch of other government policies, we usually end up with the new policy being instituted and the old ones not being repealed. So I would urge people uh, not to recommend any new government policies, even if they're trying to get rid of old ones. And uh, that goes, I suppose, as well for the uh, fair tax, that uh, uh, the consumption tax that uh, Gary Johnson would like. I, I don't think it's a, an awful enough idea for me to say, oh, I could never vote for the guy, um, or, nor for me to say, oh, the libertarians who like the guaranteed basic income are just trying to be stealth socialists and uh, destroy the free market. Uh, I mean, I, I think they mean well. They're trying to, they're trying to find... Uh, small interventions that could uh, take the place of much larger ones. Uh, I just think it's dangerous to give the government new ideas. Don't recommend new taxes to it. If it's not doing a VAT tax, don't recommend a VAT tax. If it's not, uh, if it's not using Cass Sunstein's idea of nudges to get people to behave well, don't suggest that it start using nudges. You know, just just uh, err on the side of always recommending it repeal instead of introducing things. Let's talk about some areas where there continues to be some disagreement among libertarians. And I don't mean things like immigration so much, but an area where it's not necessarily obvious what the answer 
like there's, there's no clear libertarian answer. Like on, on mm-hmm. immigration, people who favor open borders say that's the clear libertarian case. But when you're dealing with things like age of consent laws, well, there's no there's no clear statist answer there either. There's to some right. degree that has to be arbitrary. So you've talked about a bunch of issues like that in your book because I think if people hear how simple libertarianism is, it might seem like it's a closed system. All questions are answered. We've got the answers to everything. But we are still, you know, it's still a young set of ideas, basically, in its mature form. We are still hashing some of them out. What are some some of the more interesting examples of that? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I think, well, and I think it helps people get along not only within libertarianism, but it helps libertarians get along with outsiders. If people just admit there are gray areas uh, one of the things human beings hate most is saying, I don't know, uh, and admitting there are gray areas. Uh, the older I get, the more I admire agnosticism uh, and just admitting that uh, some things are still fuzzy. Um, but I'd say how you uh, go about regulating uh, a commons such as the ocean is going to be tricky no matter how you approach it. Uh, so. You'll hear uh, libertarian fantasies occasionally about radio tagging fish, and in theory it could be done, Um, but it's always going to be a little ambiguous. I mean, it's just inherently more ambiguous to carve up uh, a fluid body than it is to parcel up land, Uh, so that I think you're always going to have to keep having some debates about, uh, you know, like how exactly do you you own part of a river? Uh, Similarly, um, abortion, I mean, I I think is something that no matter what your philosophy of government is, you're still going to end up having the philosophy 101 debates about personhood and when, you know, when is the brain big enough and does it start from conception or is there a soul? There's no way you can really resolve those issues as just a footnote to your views on taxes. Uh, so, uh, that, that'll remain ambiguous. Uh, another thing that, uh, I think sometimes my fellow anarcho-capitalists don't take seriously enough is, uh, the question of when someone's so incapacitated or insane or developmentally disabled, uh, that they shouldn't be subject to the same property rules, uh, as everyone else. And, uh, and of course there's a callous streak in some of the anarcho-capitalists, so they're tempted to say, well, you know, screw them. Um, if, if, uh, if we can't figure out whether they've got full-fledged rights, then um, uh, that'll make them easier to cheat in business deals. <laughs> but uh, surely that's not the entire answer. Right, and now I want to I want to ask you, even though I kind of suggested we wouldn't talk about this, to heck with it. Don't don't ever listen to anything I say. I do want to talk a little bit about a little bit about a factional issue, simply because I mean I suppose some people are born libertarians, but a lot of us came to it from somewhere else. And I'm sure uh, probably most of my listeners came to it from somewhere else. And I have plenty of people who came from the left and plenty who came from the right. And I'm curious about your thoughts about about that whole question, because I argue with Anthony Gregory about this a lot. And I say, Anthony, I, I know there are people who come from the left, and that's great. I want those people. I want everybody. But the fact is, criticize Fox News all you want. At least they have our people on once in a blue moon. You know, whereas it's not true the other way or occasionally, very occasionally, a conservative conference will invite me or somebody else. I don't ever get invited by a left liberal conference, no matter how much overlap you tell me I have with them. It just doesn't happen. And there has to be a reason. for that. That's why I think the libertarian project was a total bust. How many liberals jumped on board for that? What do they need libertarians for? But I think there is a kind of kinship. I'm saying this provocatively, but I think there is a, a more of a kinship with conservatives. What do you think? How do you think about all that? That's one of my favorite questions, and it's complicated a little bit by the fact that uh, principles are eternal, but politics changes. So my answer back in the 90s uh, definitely would have been, oh, okay, we're obviously more similar uh, to the right. They love free markets. They hate communism. Um, They recognize that there are personal virtues that should uh, be fostered that help make a broader social order possible. They're on our side. The left hates everything we stand for. Um, But uh, times, of course, have changed a little. And uh, there there was both a libertarian project uh, to steer liberalism in a more free market direction, and uh, you could 
you could argue that there was a sort of, you know, Rand Paul, Ron Paul project uh, to steer the Republicans in a more free market direction. And by now, in 2016, maybe it's fair to say both projects failed. I mean, I think Donald Trump is a disaster. He, he, his instincts, he might occasionally do something right, almost by accident. But his instincts seem to be authoritarian, even fascistic. He hates global trade. He has denounced NAFTA, which is one of the few good things that Bill Clinton did. And uh, so it starts to look as if uh, when push comes to shove, what the right really cares about is uh, sort of xenophobia or hating some other uh, with occasional bursts of religiosity that could be useful to us or could be disastrous. Um, and of course, the, uh, the left, uh, much as I hate them, uh, you could argue, have not so much turned into socialists as turned into some sort of globalist corporatists uh, by this point, uh, especially with Hillary beating Bernie Sanders. And you know, I don't know which is worse. Uh, Bernie is a little more likable, but I don't want socialism. So maybe we should be happy that uh, Clinton and her corporate cronies crushed him. Uh, not that we want uh, the whole world to run according to Hillary Clinton's blueprint, but it's genuinely ambiguous to me which would be worse, a world full of protectionist tariffs the way that uh, Trump wants or a world full of just corporate bribery like Clinton wants, which might not look that different from the uh, relatively prosperous world we've known for the past few decades. So I, even though I, I used to be gung-ho about saying the answer is clearly the right is more like us than the left, I, I feel like at this point they've both sunk so low that there's not much to be gained by weighing in on that fight and a lot more to be gained by saying, you know what, I, when I see two monsters like this fighting, I step back and say, people, there's got to be some other alternative. So I'm trying to get in the habit of doing that more. I was, I was still as late as a few months ago. I was willing to compromise a little and lean in the Republican Party's direction. I was rooting for Rand Paul. I would have been delighted uh, if he got the Republican nomination. And, and then I would have just spent my time having to explain how come he's not perfectly libertarian. But, you know, I, I could have lived with that. Um, and then when it became clear that he was actually one of Trump's first casualties, I mean, Trump uh, went after Rand Paul almost from the get-go and basically destroyed him, not by addressing his philosophy, but by making fun of uh, Rand Paul's hair at the height, um, which should not be a model for political discourse, of course. Um, as soon as it looked like Rand Paul was doomed, I was willing to uh, hold my nose and root for Ted Cruz, who at least seemed to have some constitutionalist tendencies and talk about limited government occasionally. He, uh, he may not be great, but the sad truth is that none of the other Republican candidates were talking about those things. So Ted Cruz looked pretty good by comparison. And then once it looked like he was doomed, I just decided, you know what, I'm not really interested in thinking any lower. I mean, I suppose, it, you know, it might be an interesting experiment, like trying to see how drunk you can get before you vomit. But why? Why? So from now on, I, I'm just going to stick with saying a pox on both their houses unless uh, one of them radically improves. And I'm not really expecting it. But, you know, uh, goofy though the libertarians may be, and odd though Gary Johnson is, you know, they're at about 12% in the most recent poll. That's higher than I think they've ever been in the past. That at least attracts attention. And if, uh, as is likely, they don't win this time, it might at least make, make it easier for people to consider them as an option in the future. And even if electoral politics is not ultimately the answer uh, to solving these things, that helps foster libertarian dialogue. There will be more people out there asking, uh, what are the basics of libertarianism? Maybe tuning into a show like this, that's Libertarianism 101, or picking up my book, Libertarianism for Beginners. So I say this is a great year to try to just maximize the libertarian vote, You know, make it so big that they have to talk about it in the uh, election analysis, even if we're uh, living with a Hillary presidency for the next four years. Um, but mainly, I feel like Ever since the Cold War ended, uh, the left's favorite tactic has been to say, uh, oh, if you're, if you're a capitalist or a libertarian or a conservative, you're actually just a mean-spirited closet xenophobe. And I spent, you know, I spent like 25 years uh, ever since I was a teenager 
uh, trying to tell people that's not true. That's not true. That's not what we're like. And then along comes Donald Trump. And he is like that. He's a mean spirited xenophobe. Why on earth would we want to throw our arms around that anchor and sink with it into the depths? It's like proving every criticism the left ever made for the last 25 years. True. I don't want that. I'd rather just uh, let him sink or swim without me. And I'll stand over here making a pure libertarian argument that hopefully people will respect. Well, I want to uh, recommend your book because, first of all, I like the way it's laid out. It's actually illustrated, and it's yep. it's beautifully and humorously illustrated, actually, throughout. I actually enjoyed that aspect of it quite a bit. So it's extremely accessible. It's part of a general series of blank for beginners. And yours, I think, is – I think you are uh, even-handed in, in talking about the different – branches of the movement and different personalities. So I think it is a very good introduction for people. I'm linking to it at tomwoods.com slash 731. It's called Libertarianism for Beginners. You can grab it on Amazon. And Todd CV, thanks for the chat today. Thanks so much for having me. All right, everybody. How's this for a helpful website, by the way? Another show listener has started a site that I find very useful. It's called defiantlyread.com. And it's basically a book review site where the site owner reads books and reviews them, comments on them, gives you a sense if it's a kind of kind of book you'd be interested in reading. It's mostly but not entirely libertarian books, and heaven knows there are a lot of those. And defiantlyread.com will help you to figure out which ones are best suited to you. It's a I think it's a valuable service given that there are eight zillion books out there. So check it out at defiantlyread.com. We're going to link to that as the listener website mentioned at tomwoods.com slash 731. And you good folks all know that if you're starting a site or a blog, you got to get your hosting through my little link. Because if you do, you get a shout out, a backlink from me, video tutorials, and access to my private group of bloggers where we all plot together and help each other out. So check that deal out at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Tomorrow, if everything goes well, it is private prisons we're talking about. So I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.